Following the disappointing release of Computer Space, Nothing Industries wanted contractors Atari to work on refining a two-player version of the game. Nolan Bushnell was, however, less than impressed with David Nutting's lack of involvement with the technical side of his business. Instead, Atari would contract out as developers on a royalty basis. The first manufacturer they approached was the pinball giant Bally, which had positioned itself as a strong contender to take on new technologies through their recent acquisition of Williams Electronics. Needing to expand, Atari set up in a small warehouse facility, using their computer space royalties to buy some turnkey pinball machines along a route through the local coffee shops, bars, and the Stanford Student Union, creating what would be their primary early source of income. Hiring a former babysitter as receptionist to give the impression that they were a much larger firm, Bushnell managed to score a contract from Bally while going forward to complete the newer version of Computer Space for Nutting. This, of course, meant that they needed to hire more engineers. Enter Al Alcorn. A former co-worker of Bushnell and Dabney back in the Ampex days, Al was pessimistic about the venture and predicted failure, but took up their offer of employment because it sounded like a fun ride, and he was confident in his ability to find more work after Atari inevitably collapsed. With Alcorn on board, Bushnell pitched a complicated ice hockey game to Bally, featuring on-screen scoring, goals, field markings, multi-directional players with sticks, and a puck whose movements simulated actual ice. Realizing that this might be a bit much for Alcorn's first game development project, Nolan decided to give their new engineer a simpler project to teach him the basics of discrete logic circuits that he and Dabney had created for arcade games. So what he told Alcorn was that they had a project lined up for General Electric. He had to create a table tennis game playable on television featuring two paddles, one ball, and with a score visible on the screen. Of course, this was a lie. There was no contract from GE. Back when he was working for Nutting, Bushnell had the opportunity to play table tennis on the Magnavox Odyssey at a private distribution showing. He was unimpressed with its commercial potential, but felt like it would be the perfect sort of project to ease Alcorn into game development. The young engineer had never seen the Odyssey, so his solution to the issue of getting different angles of deflection from the paddle by dividing it up into segments provided very different and more engaging gameplay experience. A game featuring virtual paddles that would send the ball off in different and unexpected angles depending on where you hit it, and a ball that accelerated the longer you played. What he came up with was actually superior to the Magnavox Odyssey. Where he provided a single dial to scroll your paddle, the Odyssey had three, one for horizontal movement, one for vertical, and a third to provide the angle of deflection. Unlike Alcorn's segmented paddle, Bear's table tennis ball and paddle game always returned the ball on its original trajectory, unless you use that third control to give it a little English. The end result was what was to become the legendary Pong. However, Alcorn felt it was doomed for commercial failure, the price too high for the market to bear. But seeing how it turned out, Bushnell and Dabney had second thoughts about its viability. They decided to install a machine along their pinball route in Andy Cap's tavern and let patrons play to test it out while Nolan tried to sell the idea of the machine to Bally in place of the complex ice hockey game he'd originally promised. Bally's head of engineering found it interesting, but too simple to let them out of their contract. They did allow Bushnell to take the game over to Midway, recently purchased by Bally but still run in his independent division, but it was turned down there as well, as they were developing their own table tennis product and weren't interested in another one. Of course, if you know anything at all about the history of early video games, you know that Pong performed amazingly well beyond even Nolan Bushnell's wildest dreams. At one point, they got a call from the tavern owner complaining that the machine had broken, and when Alcorn came to fix it, he found that the problem was the coin bucket was stuffed full of too many quarters. They'd spilled out all over the circuit board. How does it play? Uh, less like ping pong, more like racquetball or handball. There are walls that the ball bounces off of, and the dotted line in the middle actually serves no real purpose. Bushnell and Dabney built 12 improved Pong machines, 10 to install along their coin-op route, one to send to Bally for further evaluation, and one to keep in the office. The machine performed amazingly at each installation, so much so that they began to fear that Bally would think Atari was inflating performance to convince them to take the game, 
So they cut the numbers by a third before submitting their report, but even these lower figures were met with disbelief. Unable to convince Bally to take the game, Bushnell decided it would be best to keep it in-house and manufacture the cabinets themselves. Both Alcorn and Dabney opposed this move, as it was outside the company's original scope as contracted developers, and it would be a costly financial risk. Still, eventually, Bushnell managed to convince them that it was the only way to go. Over the next few weeks, Nolan, Alcorn, Dabney, and Dabney's brother Doug poured sweat equity into assembling 50 machines using circuit boards printed at a local shop and cheap Hitachi televisions Dabney had spent his life savings to purchase. Bushnell started making calls to find someone to distribute to the machines, getting lucky with Nutting's local distributor, Lou Walter of Advanced Automatic, who'd heard about the machine's success and not only placed a large order, but talked them up to other distributors. Bob Portali of Portali Amusement Sales had made a lot of money pushing computer space aggressively and made an even bigger order. All told, with only a few calls over a few days, Nolan Bushnell was able to acquire order for 300 Pong machines. Of course, Atari had to expand again in order to meet this unprecedented demand. Bushnell, however, found it nearly impossible to open a line of credit for the business. Arcades were still linked with organized crime in the popular mind, with pinball still being illegal in cities as large as New York and Chicago. Dabney managed to persuade his personal banker at Wells Fargo to loan them $50,000. Not as much as they'd wanted, but enough to turn a disused skating rink and former concert hall into a new manufacturing facility. They set about hiring anybody they could find, hiring at local high schools and colleges and at the unemployment office, ending up with a workforce of bikers, addicts, and the otherwise unemployable working on a hastily created assembly line, stuffing components into cabinets as they rolled on by. Atari managed to fulfill their order, the company was doing well, so it's about time for Nolan Bushnell to pull something shady. All of the company's stock was tied up between the two founders and their spouses, which would make it difficult to acquire the top management staff Nolan knew Atari would need in order to continue to grow. Likewise, Bushnell saw that Dabney's practical opposition to building the units themselves foreshadowed the lack of vision to take Atari where he needed it to go. In a meeting, he offered to buy his partner out, and when Dabney declined, threatened to transfer the assets to a new company and leave Dabney with worthless stock. In the end, he had no choice but to capitulate, staying on in a new role as Vice President of Manufacturing. President of Man